Let me turn to my third category of arguments about why credit can create problems which go beyond those uh, covered in price stability. And these are the arguments which Irving Fisher and Henry Simons uh, set out. The crucial uh, point is that while credit creation creates purchasing power, it also creates ongoing debt contracts. And ongoing debt contracts create rigidities in the economy. Simons and Fisher believe that those rigidities created by ongoing debt contracts were fundamental to the fact that a boom of excess leverage up to 1929, when it burst, had created uh, the crash of 29 and uh, the Great Depression uh, thereafter. And their analysis basically uh, was pointing out that debt contracts are fundamentally different from credit contracts. Now, on this slide, I've set out some of the ways, the distinctive characteristics of debt contracts. These arguments have been made elsewhere, and in the paper I'll be distributing, I talk about the literature, so I'm very, very quickly going to mention them. Four in particular. First, with debt contracts, there is a danger of what uh, Andre Schleifer and others have called local thinking myopia. People are simply fooled in the good times into believing that risky contracts are riskless contracts and therefore there is a tendency for debt contracts to be created in excessive amounts. We get many debt contracts which in their words owe their very existence to neglected risk. Secondly, debt contracts when they turn bad, don't turn bad in a nice, smooth fashion. They, get, they turn bad with the rigidities and the costs of default and bankruptcy, which are real-world phenomenon, which are, as Ben Bernanke has pointed out, a direct contradiction of a complete uh, markets world. In a complete markets world, we would never see uh, default and bankruptcy pr procedures, but in the real world, they exist and they create rigidities. Thirdly, unlike equity supply, debt supply has to be continually rolled over. That means that the new supply of credit uh, is a crucial a variable of macroeconomic importance. And finally, the more debt you have, the more leveraged is net worth. Therefore, the danger that when you have a shock to asset prices, you have a leveraged effect on net worth, and that can then drive the behavior of highly leveraged agents, whether they be households or corporates, who in the situation of being highly leveraged do not make decisions uh, about incremental investment projects on a classic marginal basis, but are focused very heavily on simply paying down their debt in the way that Richard Koo, I think, has insightfully described in his description of what he calls a balance sheet depression uh, in Japan. These features of credit, of debt, could exist even if all debt was provided on a direct basis, i.e. if it was all individual households buying corporate bonds without banks. Indeed, I think it's quite interesting if we look at the next slide, which is slide uh, 16, that if we set out Irving Fisher's famous nine steps of debt dif deflation dynamics, uh, most of these, I won't read them, but you can look at them on the chart or in the paper afterwards, uh, could occur uh, even if we were talking about direct debt rather than bank debt. And I think they make the total level of debt to GDP in economy, private debt to GDP, uh, an important uh, variable, irrespective of whether that debt is created uh, by banks uh, or uh, in a direct fashion. But banks increase the risks that debt will be uh, created in excess amounts precisely because they can create credit and money uh, and purchasing power. And for those reasons, Irving Fisher and Henry Simons uh, ended up in a really very radical position. They believed, as uh, the quote from Henry Simons on the left-hand side of this chart uh, his, from 1936 sets out, that in the very nature of the system, banks will flood the economy with money substitutes during the booms and precipitate futile attempts at general liquidation thereafter. Simons believed that banks, fractional reserve banks, were such a pernicious a creation that we should abolish them. And this is a man, Henry Simons, who is a foundation figure of the Chicago uh, School of Economics, who in almost all of the rest of his economics is one of the most radical and complete free market laissez-faire economists. He believes that the banks are such a special case uh, that we should essentially abolish them. 
And he and Irving Fisher believed that the ability of banks to create credit and purchasing power envisaged, correctly understood by Vixel, was so dangerous that it ought to be abolished. We should not have fractional reserve banks. We should have 100% uh, reserve banks. In that environment, the monetary base equals the money supply. Of course, that then takes us back to, yeah, but if that's what you do, where does aggregate nominal demand growth come from? And Irving Fisher and Henry Simons recognized that if you abolished fractional reserve banks and you want aggregate nominal demand growth, you would have to have fiat money creation. You'd have to have uh, the government run fiscal deficits on a small amount and fund them with fiat money. They accepted uh, the implication which came out of that. So let me sum up where I've got to so far, and then I'm going to very quickly come to conclusion. Vixel identifies that banks create credit and purchasing power. He focuses on the implications of that for price stability. How do we make sure that this creation of purchasing power doesn't run out of control and create inflation? But actually, when you think about it, there are lots of other impacts of uh, credit uh, creation. We can have the beneficial but also potentially harmful fact that credit might be skewed towards investment rather than consumption. Potentially beneficial in some circumstances, potentially a source of instability in others. We can have, once we realize that credit is provided for a lot of other reasons apart from new investment projects and in particular funds, asset price cycles, we can have Minsky style asset price cycles. And we can have deflationary consequences resulting from the fact that the flip side of creating purchasing power with credit and money creation is that you create a set of ongoing debt contracts uh, thereafter. Th these insights, I think, are fundamental. In the rest of my paper that I'm very going to quickly tell you the highlights of uh, now, I make two arguments. First, that there have been a set of developments over the last 50 or 70 years which make those fundamental insights of Vixel, Minsky, Fisher, Hayek even more important than when they wrote. Secondly, that bizarrely, while the credit cycle and understanding the credit cycle has been becoming relentlessly more important, modern economics, macroeconomics, has tended to go in precisely the opposite direction and to pay less attention to it. Let me very quickly set out those two arguments, but you will have to look at the paper uh, to understand them in more detail. First, on one slide, slide 18, my argument that the financial system and the credit creation process has become increasingly important over the last 70 years. Why? Four factors. First, we have had a dramatic increase in leverage, and we've had a dramatic change in the mix of credit categories, so that now they are totally dominated by credit extended either to households or to fund the purchase of existing assets, and investment funding has become a small part of what the bank or shadow bank system does. Second point, I think there's a reasonable argument to say that if you think about Vixel's three possible constraints, freely arising constraints on the credit cycle, all of those have weakened. The process of deposit insurance, the institutional deposit insurance, has made it far less likely that the banking system in total will ever subject, subject to a total banking system run, that people will take money literally out of the whole banking system. Secondly, I think the development of the interbank system has enabled banks to hold not reserves, but claims on other banks and to treat those as their, their liquid assets. And the more that banks do that, the more that the banking system in total is acting as if it is a Vixelian one bank system. That of course depends upon risk assumptions in the interbank system. And I would simply suggest that we can think about what happened in autumn 2008 when the sudden introduction of risk perceptions into an interbank system previously thought of as risk free was in a sense a flip from the system working as a Vixelian one bank to the 
system working as a multi-bank system. Thirdly, international payments have lost all their link directly to metallic gold or to even a claim on metallic gold, and they have become all credit-based. Add those three together, and Vixel's idea of the naturally arising constraints, uh, that weakens. Third, I think uh, that it is important to understand that securitization and shadow banking through the introduction of mark-to-market collateralization and value at risk techniques has both turbocharged the credit cycle uh, and made it almost uh, written in uh, to uh, the system. It, it, it's hardwired it into the system. And fourthly, and I'll have to skip over this very uh, quickly, I think that the flip side of the credit creation for lots of reasons is that the nature of what money is has changed as well uh, in a way which has made any attempt to trace the importance of uh, the banking system through a focus on transactions money and the transactions demand for money has become decreasingly useful and indeed I think it's ended up in a situation where uh, what we actually mean by the demand for money is an almost meaningless concept. So my argument is a set of developments, all of which have taken us in the direction in which we should have paid more and more attention to the financial system and in particular the credit intermediation system. What did we do? Well, two quotes from last October. Olivier Blanchard, before the crisis, we thought we could ignore the details of the financial system. Mervyn King, within the dominant neo-Keynesian model of monetary economics, it lacks an account of financial intermediation so that money, credit and banks play no meaningful role. And that, I think, is broadly speaking true. And it's interesting to ask ourselves, how did that happen? Uh, how did we uh, end up uh, with a ignoring uh, this increasingly important factor? Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over uh, my next two slides, but they and the text set out some thoughts on the way that a post-war, even Keynesianism and uh, monetarism, tended to ignore uh, the credit creation process and either think in real variables such as C, G, Y and I, or in terms of money alone rather than credit. I think there was then a subsequent period in the 1950s to 70s when people like Gurley and Shaw and Tobin and Minsky did try and reassert a, a, a focus on credit uh, variables in the financial system, in particular uh, the vital insight of Gurley and Shaw, the concept of inside money, where the money creation creates an ongoing debt contract rather than outside money, uh, which does not. But something happens from 1970s and 80s onwards where both modern neoclassicism and uh, modern neo-Keynesianism pushes back against that and really uh, ignores it. I think uh, there are two key elements within that. Uh, I think Medigliani and Miller pushed us towards believing uh, that uh, capital structures don't matter. And I think there was a dangerous tendency to assume that if that was true or had any truth at the micro level, uh, that was true at the macro level as well. And I think there was a process where in our search for the micro foundations of macro, uh, we turned out not to be able to derive uh, micro-foundation models uh, which were both uh, mathematically robust and realistic, and we favoured mathematical robustness in the representative agents model uh, above a uh, reality. So, in my paper, I talk a bit more about that intellectual history, but I think the effect is very deep. I think it is reasonable to say that both in Academic, in undergraduate textbooks today and in advanced economics and in central bank orthodoxy, we have tended to work on a way of thinking about the credit creation process, which is simply not true. If we skip now to, sorry, slide uh, 22, a, which is put is entitled Modern Textbook Assumptions, I think it's fair to say that they make three assumptions which are dramatic and wrong over simplifications. They tend to assume that what banks do is take deposits from household depositors and lend it to borrowers. That misses the insight that banks create uh, 
credit and money and purchasing power. They tend still, and I have read back through several economic textbooks uh, over the last uh, month to check this, they tend to say that what banks do with that money is they lend it to businesses in order to fund uh, those a projects which have a higher return uh, than uh, the interest rate. And that ignores almost entirely the fact that most credit extension is no longer a funding uh, business capital projects. And they tend to talk about the way that we can get a handle on what is going on here with a demand for money which is a function of interest rates and the, well, the interest rates and why uh, the nominal demand level uh, in a way which I think totally uh, fails to capture the reality of these many impacts of credit which cannot be captured uh, in a, that uh, simple form. And if that is true of the textbooks, it is also true of the advanced treatments. As Mervyn King said, if you take the canonical statement of neo-Keynesian uh, monetary theory, which is, I guess, uh, Michael Woodford's interest and prices, which was, was of course, named, titled, uh, in homage to Vixel, I think, although it is a very, very fine piece of work in many ways, what is startling is that in an investigation of monetary theory, the role of the banks and the role of credit creation uh, in its detail is almost entirely absent. Let me try and sum up what I'm saying and what the implications are. I think on slide 23, we have to think about a banking system and its impacts as fundamentally important because it creates credit and money and it allocates that credit to specific uh, uses and agents. As a result of that, credit creation has an impact on nominal demand and on price stability, yes, but it also has it on the investment and the consumption cycle. It can produce real investment over investment cycles. It can produce self-reinforcing existing asset cycles. And because it creates ongoing debt contracts, it creates debt overhang and deleveraging uh, risks. Modern macroeconomics has tended to cut through that extraordinary complexity and focus almost entirely, uh, this is exhibit 24 here, on one dimension, one vector, the way in which interest rates and interest rate expectations cut through the banking system almost as a veil and impact nominal demand, which in relationship to the output gap and with some expectations in there as well and some sticky prices uh, produce price stability. I think that way of focusing on price stability is inadequate, and I think if we go back to the key insights uh, in Vixel, although he focused primarily on that, uh, it, it becomes obvious we have to focus on other things as well. What are the implications of this for policy? Five, price stability alone is an insufficient focus. But also financial stability alone is an insufficient focus. We cannot focus simply on whether our banks are going to be solvent or not, because we could have credit cycles created by still solvent banks. Credit cycles matter in themselves, categories of credit matter in themselves, and levels of leverage matter in themselves. That, I think, means that we have got to be proceeding not by simply adding financial stability as a new standalone central bank responsibility, but heading towards an integrated management and constraint of the credit cycle via a combination of interest rate policy, macro prudential tools, I believe the restoration of the use of quantitative reserve requirements, which of course Vixel uh, believed were uh, an obvious way to constrain credit growth, and direct constraints on categories of borrower. Let me end with a final comment on that suggestion I made earlier, that you can think about private credit creation as one of two ways of ensuring that we have aggregate nominal demand. If we had a pure metallic money system, you have a danger of inadequate demand. You can make up for that by fiat money creation, but we tend to be terrified of that because of the political allocation and the dangers of excess. Therefore, we have a system which has private allocation 
of credit, and that allocation of credit is crucial to, and that creation of credit is crucial to the creation of aggregate nominal demand. That has some advantages, but the crucial point is it also has consequences that require very careful management. Um, I'm actually recording this on August the 22nd. In yesterday's Financial Times, August the 21st, I read a very interesting discussion of people's worries about increasing emerging market uh, leverage and reference to a concept that people are increasingly talking about, which is the credit intensity of growth. It said that it was now clear that Singapore and Hong Kong, that the credit intensity of growth, which was defined as the amount of credit growth required to drive GDP growth, had doubled. Now, think about the credit intensity of growth. Suppose that credit to GDP, debt to GDP, was already 100%. And suppose you said that the credit intensity of growth at the marginal level, suppose this concept is right, uh, was two, i.e. that you had to create two units of extra credit for actually one unit of GDP. It would be inevitable that the leverage level of the overall economy would go up. So I think we have a concept here of a credit intensity of growth, which could mean that we're suggesting that in order to have GDP growth, we need not simply have, we need not simply to have a high level of leverage, but a relentlessly rising level of leverage. That I think must be wrong, that must be dangerous, and I think we need to reflect very carefully about what is it about the way we have run our modern economies that we seem to be assuming that in order to have adequate a GDP growth, we need a level of credit, GDP, credit growth uh, which results in a relentlessly rising level of leverage. Thank you very much, and I hope that I'm now going to appear in person by, from China uh, in about uh, uh, three weeks' time. I hope that that part of the system works. Thank you.